In Mark chapter 12, verse 41, we're told that Jesus set a cross from the treasury. He actually positioned himself by the treasury box in the temple. And he sat there and he just watched. He watched as people came into the temple. And he watched as they put in their money into the box. But it's interesting to note that Mark chapter 12 says, verse 41, that he watched how, that he observed how they put into the treasury. The Lord wasn't interested in the amount that they put in, but he was interested in the how they put in. He was interested in the attitude with which they gave and the motivation with which they gave. And of all those that gave in the time that the Lord was observing this, he was most impressed with a poor widow. She came up and she gave the least amount and she was probably the least in prestige of all the people that gave. But she gave all that she had, two mites, just the most minute amount you could possibly give. But the Lord said that she had given in that small amount all that she had. The others just gave a trickling from their abundance. But she gave all that she had. And in her giving, her trust in the Lord was made evident. Her gratefulness was seen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul refers to giving when we give to the Lord, when we give to the Lord's causes as a grace. In verse 1, Paul says, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. In verse 6, he says, this grace. Verse 7, this grace also. Verse 9, the grace of our Lord. As we know, God's grace gives. In fact, part of the nature of grace is to give. Just week before last, we talked about grace and we defined it as God's riches at Christ's expense. And we talked about how grace supplies and grace sustains. It's God giving and giving and giving over and over again. There's a hymn that was written, and it says, And in his infinite riches in Christ, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. That is the nature of grace. The nature of grace gives. It gives sacrificially. It gives abundantly. It gives voluntarily. And it gives unreservedly. God's grace is first bestowed in us, to us, and upon us. And then it is meant to flow through us. As believers, we are to replicate the grace to others that we have been given by God himself. So Paul begins this exhortation with three testimonies of givers. So we start with three testimonies of givers. And the first is the testimony of a giving congregation. The Macedonians, they were a congregation that gave. Now I get really excited about giving congregations. In Vista, it was a giving um, congregation. We were not that large of a church. In fact, we had 3,000 people, which seemed humongous to me in Vista. But one of the Bible college students came out and says, oh, so you're not a mega church. You're one of the smaller Calvary churches. And we're like, we'll visit you when you have your church. <laughs> I remember he said to us, you've been here 13 years and you only have 3,000 people? And we're just like, yeah. But they gave. They gave and they gave and they gave. We had a thing at Christmas that's called an angel tree. And what you do is, from the angel tree is you can pick a child's name and a, and a gift. And you buy that gift for that child. And these presents go to um, children whose fathers or mothers are incarcerated in prison. 
Well, we got all these angels for our angel tree. They were gone after first service. The people who came to second service were quite upset and third service. So we asked for more. We asked for double the amount that we could give even more gifts. We put them out at first service, and again, they were all gone. <laughs> second and third service was getting very, very upset, so we asked for more, and we didn't put them out till second service. <laughs> again, second and third service, they were all completely gone. So much so that a bank in town had an angel tree in the corner of their bank, and only two were taken. They asked us if they could give to us their angel tree. <laughs> we took their angel tree. They were gone within 15 minutes. We weren't a rich church in Vista. We were just a giving church. I remember that we also decided to give baskets to the poor. We had so many donations, we didn't know what to do with all of it. I came in, and there were about 100 people that showed up, and they had this assembly line in our fellowship hall where they were putting things in the baskets, and they were wrapping the presents for the children. And everybody was singing. <laughs> They were singing carols, and they looked like elves. They just had such <laughs> delight and such joy as they were all fellowshipping together. And I had signed up to be a delivery person, and Brian had come with me, and Brian said, Cheryl, you know this is a Saturday. You need, know I need to study, and you know this really wasn't convenient. And I said, Brian, I just want to do it. And he wouldn't let me go alone because, again, I'm delivering to prisoners' children these gifts. You never know if daddy's out and visiting. So he wanted to go with me. Well, we went, and we had such an opportunity. He said we could only take 10 baskets. We had such an opportunity to share the Lord. We had to fight for those baskets, I want you to know. People were fighting to deliver those baskets. That's the only time we had any falling outs with anybody in our congregation. But we got 10. And we took them to these different houses and to see the children's faces light up because their houses didn't have any decorations. And did I tell you there were also decorations in the baskets for the house? I mean, these people in Vista just kept giving and giving and giving. We took it in. The kids were so excited. I got a chance to share the gospel with the little kids. Brian would take the adults. We finished up the 10, and Brian said, that was great. We got to get 10 more. We went back. There were only three left, and Brian pulled rank as pastor. <laughs> but when a congregation gives, there is something so exciting that happens. And Paul nails it when he talks about what happened with the Macedonians. It was in their affliction. When he is talking about the churches of Macedonia, he is talking primarily about Thessalonica. He is talking about Berea and Philippi. Those are the three churches that he is talking about. All three of those churches had been centers in the Alexander Empire. And so when Rome took over, Rome oppressed these three cities. They taxed them higher than any other cities of Rome. They also plundered these cities. In Thessalonica, a great persecution had risen against the Christians. In fact, it was the first great persecution that came against believers. And what had happened is the governor of that region ordered that every article of food that was sold in the marketplace be first dedicated to idols. And then he would have the soldiers watch and see how the people reacted, knowing it was dedicated to idols. And that's how they began to catch the Christians, because the Christians did not want to eat anything that was dedicated to idols. And they begin to arrest them, and they begin to murder the believers in Thessalonica. It was this type of affliction, taxed, oppressed, persecuted, hunted, that these believers chose to give out of their affliction. They didn't wait for peace or for blessed circumstances in order to give. Under severe persecution, they gave. Paul says that they gave in their poverty. Again, they didn't wait till they had an abundance of resources to give. They gave even when they didn't have much to give, like the widow with her two mites. Nothing would keep these believers from giving. They gave with joy 
They were excited about giving. They were excited about the opportunity to give. We're told they gave liberally, beyond their means. That means that they gave freely without demanding something in return because that's what grace does. Grace gives without asking anything in return. Jesus, in speaking about how we are supposed to give, he said, when you have a dinner, don't invite those that will invite you back. Invite those that you know you're not going to get an invitation back from. And then you'll be like your father in heaven. In England, I used to have all the single boys, I called them boys because they were under 30, in our church over for dinner once a week, sometimes twice a week. You know, it really pays off because that's how we found my son-in-law. You choose the boy that volunteers to help with the dishes, and you say, aha, I have a daughter. <laughs> but I, I didn't expect these boys to ever be able to repay. In fact, even if they did invite us over for dinner, I don't know that I would want to respond. <laughs> but they gave freely with not caring who they were giving to or any prestige in giving, no credit. Jesus talked about the Pharisees that would sound the trumpet and blow the horn before they gave. Excuse me, I'm giving. Does everyone see I'm giving? Have you, have you ever gone out to dinner and you're just so, you know, you're excited, you know exactly what you want on the menu. You're about to order it. You know you've got enough money, and the person across from you says, I'm paying. And you know they're cheap. And you know you know you got to get the salad. <laughs> and you're just like, no. I so wanted the hot fudge. Thing. But every extra you order, huh, hmm, oh. You're just like, no. I hate those dinners. Yeah, I like it better when Brian says, we've got this. It's like, yes! There is this one dessert at this one place, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, because I'm going to save you the calories. But it's toasted coconut over ice cream with hot fudge sauce. It's like the only dessert I want any place I go. In fact, Brian bribes me to go there, because they have lamb, and he likes the lamb. And all I want. All I want when I go there is just the hot fudge sundae. You know, I'll get a baked potato, because all I want is that hot fudge sundae at the end. You know, but, but so I'm paying. And you know they're going to, they want, they want it all back. Or, or you know, you go with them, and, and you treat, and it's kind of a nice restaurant, and then they ask you out, and they take you to this place where everything is, you know, it's like the pound store. Everything's a dollar. You know, order anything you want. Have it all. There's, there's just, that's not the way to give. <laughs> that's not how the Macedonians gave. They gave willingly. They gave freely. They didn't need credit for it. Or do you have those people that they take credit for things that they didn't do? Does that drive you crazy? Oh, it just drives me crazy. Well, I paid for lunch. You're like, yeah, all of $5. But they're, yes, and I treated you to lunch the last time. And you just, stop it. You know, or I had this, this friend, and I use that term very, very, very loosely, because she would come over to my house, and any time anyone came to the door, and I would stop what I was doing to entertain her, and I really was entertaining her all the time. Now all my rewards are gone because I'm telling you this story. But I was entertaining her, entertaining her, entertaining her. And anytime anyone would come to the door, if they were a pastor, you know what she would do? She would run over and pretend like she was washing my dishes. And she'd go, oh, I'm just, I'm washing Cheryl's dishes. I'm sorry I can't talk. And I'm just like, I was washing my own dishes. I just would be so shocked that I would have the people just stay longer to see if she could finish them up. <laughs> and say, so, you know, there's a vacuum in the closet. 
You know, but there are those people that want credit for everything they do. They'll tell you about every gift they've given. You say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing really well. I tithed today, and then I gave to this person. And then when the little boy came and selling cookies, I bought some from him, and I gave him an extra dollar. You're like, oh, good for you. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? You're getting all your rewards now. I want my presents in heaven. I want lots of presents in heaven. Of course, I just lost four, but... But this congregation gave willingly of their own volition. Then in verse 4, we're told that they gave eagerly, imploring Paul with all urgency that he would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They begged for the opportunity to give. They wanted to be a part of the body, the body of Christ in ministering. They wanted to feel that fellowship, not only with the others who were giving, but also with the recipients that were receiving. They wanted to feel that kindred, that spirit, that fellowship that gives. They had a heart for their brethren that were suffering because they knew that suffering. They knew oppression. They knew poverty. And it made them more tender towards those that were in Jerusalem that were suffering, those for whom Paul was collecting the gift. They gave spiritually. Paul says that first they gave themselves to the Lord and then to the disciples by the will of God. Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Romans 12.1 tells us that we are to give ourselves first to the Lord as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. Have you ever asked the Lord what he wants? What do you want? What do you want? Maybe you said it like this. What do you want from me? Or what else do you want from me? You know those times when trials are pulling in, you're like, what am I supposed to learn from this? Where are you going with this? And the Lord says something like this. You. What do you want from this? You. I want all of you. I want your whole heart. I want everything that you have, everything that's in you. And that's what these precious members of the Macedonia churches did. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Everything they had, they gave first to the Lord. Until we give to the Lord, we really aren't ready to give to anybody else. They gave themselves first to the Lord, and then they availed themselves to Paul and the ministers of the gospel according to the will of God. Now, that's important. Why is that important? Because the need is not the call of God. There's always needs, and there's always ways that you can minister to those in leadership, but you've got to know in what particular way God would have you minister. You have got to determine the will of the Lord. And so you can only determine the will of God when you first give yourself to God, and then you pray and say, Lord, in what way? I had a friend who was a biblical counselor. She had her degree in counseling, and she was excellent, absolutely excellent. She was a, she's, she's very, very um, uh, bright, um, very accomplished, but she always wrote everything with a purple pen. You don't need to know that, but I just felt like saying that. <laughs> it was one of those details that I just love to tell. But she refused to charge for counseling. But she told me, she said, Cheryl, you know when I know when I'm getting through to them? I said, no. She said, when they give me something in return. She said, when they give me something in return, she said, I know that I've gotten through to them. She said, because most people that come to me that are problemed, their problem is, is that they don't give. They hoard. They hoard attention. They, they, they hoard praise. They hoard it. They, they don't want to give attention to others. They don't want to give time to others. They don't want to give to any ministry. They don't want to give of themselves. They're the people that always feel like victims and say, what am I, a rug in front of the door? She said, that's the person who doesn't want to give. And she said, so many of the problems come from a lack of generosity, a lack of giving, because she said, a lack of giving is a lack of gratitude. 
It's a misunderstanding of how blessed you are and how much has been given to you, not just by the Lord, but by the church and by believers and by your family. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 13, Paul says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. The Macedonians were doing that. This was given to Thessalonica, this instruction. Isn't it interesting that they followed it so that Paul could brag about them and say, they're doing it. They're giving themselves first to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Next, we heard about a giving congregation. Paul speaks of our giving Lord. We have a Lord that has given to us so much. Verse 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Philippians 2, 5-8 through 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus gave up his prestige and became a bondservant that he might heal us and walk among us. He gave up the comforts of heaven and he lived as a man among men. And through his poverty, he made many rich. He was crucified with the poor. Isaiah said, in his death, he died with the poor, but he made his grave with the rich. He was obedient to the point of death, to condemnation, that he might enrich us by his righteousness. And then he says again in John chapter 17, he prays that we might be with him in glory and receive his glory. We serve a generous Lord. Have you ever realized that? I mean, sometimes we think of the benefits and the gifts of Christ stopping with the cross. And we forget that today we have a God that we can call upon. And we can ask him for whatever we need. And what does he do? He supplies those needs according to his riches and glory. Our Lord is continuing to give to us. We go to him in need, in deficiency, and he gives to us all that we need. He gave us access to his Father. He gave us the promises of God. He gave us heaven. He gave us glory. He gave us the forgiveness of sins. He gave us his very life because he has imparted to us his very life. And then Paul speaks of giving leaders. You see, the leaders are to be givers also. They are to give to the congregation again and again and again. As I was growing up, we had the phone for the church in my room. It was in my bedroom. Don't ask me why. I didn't counsel. I was only five. But we had the telephone for the church. And I remember it would go off every night at dinner time. And we all just would think, oh, Daddy, please don't get it. But he said, a minister is on call 24-7. He didn't use that phrase because that's like kind of 2,000 phrase. But he said something really close to that. It's my NIV version. <laughs> and he would catch the phone, and he would pray with those people, and he would talk with those people. One of the things I've always admired about my daddy is we can never go to a restaurant and eat dinner without somebody coming up to the table and saying, Chuck Smith, is that you? And he turns with the most gracious, benevolent smile, puts out his hand and says, and you are? And he speaks to them and he just gets that, you know, that Chuck Smith smile. I'll show you. <laughs> my mom said I got my dad's smile. And he is so gracious, so kind. He just, he never meets a stranger. 
And I've just admired that. My dad keeps giving. We think about it. He's 80 years old, and he hasn't stopped giving yet, nor my mom. They are in the ministry for life and every hour of the day. So he speaks of Titus. Titus was a church leader. You know, there's a reason that pastors are called ministers. Minister is a fancy word for servant. Pastor is actually means shepherd. It's somebody who watches sheep. That's what they do. Titus went to the Corinthians of his own volition. He went to them and he lived with them and among them. He was for those people. Not only with those people, but he was for the Corinthians. He wanted the best for them. He found out that maybe they might not accept Paul's letter. He didn't know how they would receive what Paul had said in that letter. So he went and he stayed with them and he presented the letter to them and he watched them and he prayed for them. He gave of his time. He gave of his energy. He gave of his heart and he gave it of his own volition. He was earnest in his care and diligent and a fellow worker for their benefit. And so Paul gave the examples of a giving congregation because we have a giving Lord and then we should have giving leaders. Then Paul goes on to say the test of giving or the attitude in which we give shows the maturity of our confession. Paul says in verse 7, but as you abound in everything, see that you abound in this grace also. You see, giving is a proof of faith. It really is. Do I believe that God will provide so I can give this to the Lord? Am I so grateful for all God has done? Am I cognizant? Am I recognizing how many blessings he's pouring into my life every day so that I can give? You see, the widow was aware of all that God had given her. She was aware that God would take care of her so she could give all that she had. Abraham was ready to give the son of promise when God asked in Genesis chapter 22. He was ready to give because Hebrews eleven nineteen 19 says, concluding that God was able to raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And then in Romans 5, 21, Abraham was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham gave by faith. Faith allowed him to give that which was most precious to him, that which he loved more than anything else, that which was promised to him. Abraham was able to give by faith. Then it is a proof of our speech. Do you believe what you espouse? It's so easy sometimes to tell others, oh, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And we can give that to others, but when we are financially slighted, do we believe? Do we still give to the Lord? Do we still give to others? Do we believe the promises of God? Is our speech sincere? In 2 Timothy 2.6, Paul says, The hardworking farmer must be the first partaker of the crops. In other words... I must be the first person that lives what I say. I cannot present to you something unless I have lived it first. So giving proves my faith. About three weeks ago, we got a Federal Express man at the door. Isn't that like the most exciting thing? When a box comes to your house. My grandson called me. I sent him up a, a Valentine's card. And he was just lamenting the fact that nobody was sending him anything in the mail anymore. And he got to his mailbox, and there was a card for Cade and a card from Ryder 
from me. Of course, I'd given him a Target gift certificate and I had forgotten to put the amount in. So he was calling to find out how generous I really was as a grandma. <laughs> and so he said to me, Grandma, Grandma, I really like the card. I really like the gift certificate. I said, it's only $5. That's okay, Grandma. That's a really good thing to send me things. It's really good. <laughs> I really, really like it. You, you, you can do that more. It's good. <laughs> I said, okay, thank you. So Brian and I received this Federal Express package in the mail. And I opened it up, and it was a check for $1,200. And it says, the money that you have requested. I didn't request any money. I didn't know what this was about, but it looked really legitimate to me. And I said, Brian, maybe the Lord's just blessing. I have no idea where this check came from. And Brian says, no, it's a gimmick. So he's reading all over to find out if we, if we sign this check, will we end up with a new loan on our house? You know, will they come and take our kids away? What is this going to do for us? And I said, Brian, you know, you just need to receive it. You need to receive it. Let's just deposit it. Let's just put it in and just enjoy when God's blessing. Let's just do it. Well, I get to England, and Nancy Sylvester says to me, did you get our check? And I was thinking, that's that $1,200. I said, not $1,200. She goes, yes. And I said, yes, we did. She said, well, I wrote you. I said, you didn't write me about that check. I would remember if you wrote me about that check, because I was impressed by that check. I thought it was blessings from heaven. And she said, you know, no, that's this. And we turned it around, and I said, oh, OK. She said, so do you have the money? And I said, no, I don't have the money because I didn't know that, that's my money. Ah, Brian signed the back of that check. No. But I said, no, I, I, I don't have the money, but I will get you the money. And I couldn't get in touch with Brian, and I wanted to tell him, you know that check? We're not quite as blessed as we thought. We get to bless others with it. And I had to pull out money out of my ATM account, and you can only pull out so much each day, and I had to do it three days in a row. And you know what? There was this struggle in me. It was their money. But I was saying, but you know, this is a lot of money. <laughs> and you know, once I pulled out that money, I couldn't get any more money for me. And my credit cards weren't working. Because you know what? My credit card companies didn't believe I was in England. They, they thought that was some other Cheryl Broderson using my credit cards in England. Don't ask me how she got there. Maybe she was on the same plane. So, you know, this is all I got. And I have to give it away every day, three days in a row. <laughs> and, you know, it was the weirdest thing. And I said, Lord, why, why am I being like this? I mean, it's their money. I don't know why they did it this way. And they didn't write us and they didn't tell us until I got in England because there are better ways to get the money. I mean, they could go through Brian. Why do they have to go through me? I'm, you know, I'm like, money. But Brian's like, money. You know, we must be first partakers of everything we say. We cannot say these things until we're ready to give. So it's, it's an honest disclosure of whether our speech is true or not. Did I believe that I could get by on the 10 pounds in my wallet? Yes, I could. In fact, I didn't even spend it. I had people keep treating me, so I kept getting salads. It was... <laughs> But we must be the first to live by the gospel. Next, it shows our knowledge. It's a proof of our knowledge. Do we have this understanding about God, that we serve a generous God? I think sometimes we forget that. Psalm 103.2 says, forget not all his benefits towards us. You see, it shows our knowledge of God. It shows our knowledge of the benefits that God has given us. It's an understanding of God's promises. It shows a knowledge of the promises of God. I know these promises. I know this is true. In Malachi 3, 10 through 11, the prophet says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that 
there will not be room enough to receive it. Do we realize that we're those who fish all night and catch no fishes? But at the word of the Lord, we go out and cast down our nets, and they are full of fish. Do we understand, do we have a knowledge of the principles of God that you cannot outgive God? That he gives more in return? It proves our knowledge of God and God's promises and God's principles. Then it showcases our diligence. Will we do what we have committed to do? In verse 10, Paul says to them, follow through with what you committed to a year ago. How many times have you said, oh, I'm going to pray for that person every single day? And then you realize four days has gone by. And you're like, what was that person's name again? You know, there, there is that part of us that just forgets so easily. That's just part of our nature. We just get caught up with our own lives, our own problems, our, our own bills. And we forget about those. So Paul says, I'm going to give you a, a way to remember this. I want you to set something aside every day. Because in setting that aside, it shows diligence. Every day to put a little bit aside. And guess what it does? When you're putting something aside every day, you're thinking about those people every single day. My mom used to keep a little, now she's going to lose rewards. My mom used to keep a little bank above the washing machine. And it was a little house, and it was for the missionaries in Yugoslavia. And all the change that we would leave in the pockets of our garments would go into that little bank every day until she could help to pay for a kitchen for some missionaries in Yugoslavia. But it made you cognizant every day of those missionaries and what their struggle was. They didn't have a stove. They didn't have a refrigerator. All that was going towards them. And she would set aside a little bit, and then she would add to that, and she would say, don't you want to add to that? We also used to have, um, my aunt had an orphanage in Ecuador called the House of Happiness. And my mom and dad had a little girl that they supported, and they would put her on the refrigerator, and they would set something aside for her every day. And it's interesting because when my daughter would get naughty, my mom would say, that's OK. I've got my little adopted girl right here. <laughs> Kristen would just glare at that little girl on the refrigerator. When we are, when we are diligent in these things, it shows that we truly believe in the work of God. We truly believe in God's people, and we want to be a partaker. When we are diligent, it shows integrity, it shows discipline, it shows awareness. And then, it is a proof of our love. Do we love God more than our security, like Mary with the alabaster box? Do we love our brethren more than our comfort or our security? Do we love God's work? Are we enthusiastic about God's work? Do we want to be a part of all God's doing? Are we thankful for all that God has done for us? Because as we know, giving is a natural outgrowth of love. I remember when I fell in love with Brian, I just wanted to just get him something every day. I just, oh, I would see a shirt and I would buy it for him or I would see just anything. And he was always bringing me flowers. Don't ask me what happened to that. <laughs> but there was, I hope he's listening. But there is that aspect of when you love, you want to give. And then it showcases our sincerity. Do we really, really care? Are we willing to give? Because that shows whether we really, really care. You know, people will talk magnanimously about some cause, but they don't want to give to it. Are we sincere? Do we really care about the things of God? When the Corinthians committed, did they plan on following through? Or was it just a boast to make themselves look commendable? Were they sincere? Then Paul moves on to talk about the tokens of grace. The tokens of grace. Because you see, 
Again, you cannot outgive God. When we give, God gives back. So in verse 10, Paul said, it is to your advantage to give. It's for you. I'm giving you an opportunity to give so that you can be enriched, so that you can be a partaker of what God is doing, so you can get presence in heaven. What happens when we give? What are the benefits personally? Now, this should not be our motivation, and yet this should be part of our expectation. In verse 10, again, he says it's to your advantage, to your blessing. We become like Jesus when we give because he gave and he gives and he continues to give. We become partakers of God's work and of God's glory. It's so exciting, as I said, to go over to England and, and I feel such a part of all those girls, those women. We gave three and a half years just establishing a church in London. I remember teaching those girls, and oh my goodness, you never had girls who didn't want to learn more than those girls. They would pass food around during my Bible study. They would say, apple, anyone want an apple? And I'd be like, no, I'm teaching right now. They, biscuit, anyone want a biscuit? No, I'm teaching right now. Let's go on to the next verse. Chocolate, anyone want a chocolate? All right, one. But it would just, <laughs> this would be the way it was. And I remember their husbands forced them to come to the Bible study because they said, Brian, we're growing, but our wives aren't growing. Brian said, that's all right. I've got a secret weapon. My wife, Cheryl. So they came and they were just, you know, what are you going to teach us? And I, you know, I was a little scared. But you know, that investment, and I look at them now, and from that group, there are four pastor's wives. And they're the best pastor's wives. They are so good, I'm watching them. And I'm watching them minister to the women in their congregation. And I'm sobbing my eyes out. They've got the South London Choir, I want them to come here. They are so good. They are, oh, and they're lively, they move. It's just, it's good. You know, I, I sat down, but I, just a little bit, so they wouldn't feel bad. It was just so awesome to, to see the dividends and to feel that I'm a part of that work. I have a belonging. I have a fellowship with them. They are mine, and I am theirs. There's just this commonality between us. We have fellowship with others in ministering to the saints. We have this identity. We are part of something so big. It is so exciting to meet the body of Christ in other countries. And then you realize, man, this thing is big. This thing that Jesus is doing, man, this is international. This is so big. Then God gives back. We're told in Matthew 6, 4, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He's going to give to you now. He's going to provide all your needs now. But then you're going to have heavenly rewards because we're told in Matthew chapter 19 when he told, talks to the rich young ruler, he says, sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. There are rewards in heaven. In Acts 20, 35, Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There is blessing, which means happiness in divine favor in giving. We're told in verse 2 of this chapter that it caused an abundance of joy to be in the Macedonian churches. And then we have that divine provision. When we give, God gives us back divine provision. Listen to this scripture in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down like brown sugar, Shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you give, it will be measured back to you. And then when we give, we also have the testimony of faith. Isn't it wonderful to be able to share with others how God provides 
and the glory of God's divine provision. You know, it's interesting. I really have forgotten so much. But I have a daughter who remembers everything. You ever have one of those daughters with the memory of an elephant? Do you remember when I was two, Mom, and you did this? It's like, I think that was another woman. But when, I, when I'm with her, and today's her birthday, so I'm going to be with her today, and that's another glory. My grandkids came down to visit me. Oh, so exciting. But when I'm with her, she reminds me, well, Mom, remember when we didn't have any money? Because she used to listen to everything. She was one of those child who, ch children who pretend not to listen. One of those childs who pretends not to listen, and they're listening to everything you say. She was smart, though, because she'd go real quiet. Because when they go real quiet, you think they're not listening, so you say all the names you shouldn't. And then later they go, is that really true about Hillary? Did she really do that? And you're like, <gasps> She was only five. It was so scary. But she will remind me of all the times that God provided when she was young. In fact, she's a pastor's wife. And I said, you know, Kristen, I was praying for you. And I said to the Lord, oh, I know she's ready to be a pastor's wife. I, I remember this, and I remember that. And she said, oh, Mom, there's more than that. I've got a heritage. I remember answered prayer. And I just went, yeah, praise the Lord. But she remembers those stories. What a heritage. You know, but in order to have that heritage, guess what has to happen first? You have to give it away. You have to suffer deficit before you can, suffer, <laughs> before you can get the glory of provision, don't you? You have to have a need before you can receive the glory. But our God provides. Then Paul said, it is important to touch, to not touch the gifts intended for God. There is a sacred trust with the gifts and with the offerings that the people give. Remember the showbread? Remember the things that were given to the Lord. They're holy. They're sanctified. God chooses the portion for the priest. But these things are not to be touched. Remember Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 6? They lied about what they were giving. They kept back a portion. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira was not that they kept back a portion, but they lied about what they were giving to the Lord. They made it sound like they were giving more to the Lord than they actually were giving. But sh Paul shows the greatest diligence and carefulness about these funds. He has three chosen men to guard what is given, to attest to what is given. These are diligent men. And Paul always acknowledges that the gift is ultimately from God and belongs to God. It is for the body of Christ, honorable in the sight of God, there must be a stern realization that the funds belong to God and they are from our God to our God and not for self-advancement or for self-comfort. Paul says we do this in the sight of men, showing integrity with God's funds before men. Giving is still a testimony to the world. It still is. It's a testimony of God's provision. It's a testimony of God's love being acted out in the body of Christ. It's an opportunity for the world to see God's provision in action, an opportunity for the world to see God's love in action, an opportunity for the world to feel God's touch. It's the proof of the sincerity of our confession. There was a man in England named George Muller, and in his lifetime, he fed and housed and dressed over 10,000 orphans. He would collect them right off the streets of England. He was given millions of dollars in his lifetime, but he said, I am nothing but a conduit for the blessings of God. He never held those. He never owned a house for himself. Every bit of money and finances that he received went right to the causes of the Lord. He also supported over 50 missionaries during his lifetime. Giving is a testimony of grace, operating and alive in our lives. Our Savior gave. Our Savior gave. Let's pray. 
Lord, we want to thank you for the grace that has been given to us. So much grace. Lord, may we be cognizant of that grace which you have so freely bestowed upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.